All right. So welcome back from the break. Uh, today we're taking attendance, so make sure you sign that roster that goes around. Uh, brief summary of what happened last time. We talked about regular expressions, which correspond to regular languages. Uh, we showed a correspondence. We said regular expressions can be constructed inductively, recursively from small cases and combined through several operators, right? union, concatenation, and clean closure. And you can build the machines in a parallel way, in a way that parallels these recursive rules. And therefore, any regular expression can be easily converted to a finite automata. We gave an example, regular expression becomes a finite automata according to these conversion rules. It gets to be quite large, but you can minimize it. And minimizing it involves combining similar states. It's like writing a piece of code that's a little shorter by being more efficient, more thrifty, taking out redundancies. So by the time we minimize this one, we end up with three states from the original 16 or so. There's a fast algorithm analog again to do that in general. If you want to take as much as n squared, it's actually quite easy. And um, the next half of the proof was a little bit more involved. So this half of the proof, the first half I just described that we talked about last time is you have a regular expression, you want to convert it to a finite automata that accepts the same language that that regular expression denotes. The converse is also true. That is, if you have a finite automata, you can always come up with a regular expression that denotes the language accepted by that finite automata. That one is a bit of a trick, and we sort of went to the proof quickly last time just to remind you what happened. We take a regular a finite automata and, and we massage it into a generalized finite automata by allowing on the arcs, on the transitions, not just individual characters or symbols, but entire regular expressions. So an arc can trigger on a regular expression that matches what's ahead of you in the input stream, the read-write head, what is looking up ahead. So it can transit or transition not just on a character, but an entire regular expression, actually quite a long substring. So we take a finite automata, we add to it a lot of epsilon state, a super state, a start state, and we put empty transitions on all the transitions that aren't there, meaning they cannot be triggered. So this doesn't change the finite automata because an empty uh, set on a transition is not even an epsilon. It's nothing, so it can't be triggered yet. But you, you'll see in a minute why we're doing this. We also make all the self loops appropriately. And by the time we do this, we can reduce the size of this generalized finite automata by one state at a time at each step and get more and more complicated regular expressions on the transitions. And at the end, there'll be only one super state, one start state, and one super final state. And that will be a single transition. And that regular expression on it, which will be very complicated at that point at the end, will be the actual regular expression denoting the language of the original machine. So the trick is to find a triangle. And always such a triangle you can find it. It exists because all triangles are there, because all possible edges are there. Regular expressions on these arcs are P, R, S, and T. And so what you can do is you can sidestep this state here, eliminate it, by basically saying instead of going from here, from I to J directly through P, you can also go, sure, through P, but also through R, S star, and then T. And so you combine these three arcs here into one arc. And once it's done like that, you can combine these two arcs because they're just parallel, combine them with a union. So now these two arcs get replaced by a single arc on which it is the combined regular expression. It's the union of the two regular expressions on these two parallel arcs. Yeah. Good question. Does that, does that mean that there's a unique, minimum, uh, I guess, minimal regular expression, shortest regular expression for every finite automata? Is that what you're saying? Or, or, or is there a unique? smallest regular expression that denotes a particular regular expression? Can you minimize a regular expression? Very good question. Um, so we already, sh we already discussed how to minimize a finite automata. That, that, that one is easy. And minimizing a finite automata is simply going after the least number of states, the smallest, the least number of states. But minimizing a regular expression actually is much harder. You can, you can do it. There's algorithms for it. But nobody knows how to do it in polynomial time. It's an open question, actually. So very good question. She asked an open question. If anybody can actually solve it in polynomial time, it's probably an instant PhD. Uh, probably a lot more than that, actually, because it's a, it's a very famous 
open question upon which many other open questions depend. Um, so minimizing regular expressions actually is tricky business. Uh, so is minimizing non-deterministic finite automata. That's tricky business too. There's no known polynomial time algorithm to do that. Although the one we showed can minimize deterministic finite automata, not non-deterministic ones. All right, so you keep hitting this transformation with these uh, triangle arcs, reducing it by one arc at a time, coming up with more and more complicated regular expressions on the remaining arcs. And by the time you're done, there'll be a single arc remaining and nothing else with a single start state, a single end state. And that label, whatever that regular expression is here, will be the regular expression for the entire language. And it will be quite long at that point. Now, of course, you can still minimize it. You know. So just because there's no polynomial time algorithm to minimize a regular expression in general doesn't mean you can't specifically minimize special cases. They may be easy. Just like the halting problem is undecidable in general. But if I just give you a short program like begin end, you know it halts. It's not mysterious, even though the, the general problem is undecidable. Specific instances could be easy. But in general, there's very, very hard instances. OK, so um, now the characterization is complete. We show that for every regular expression, there's a finite automata that accepts the same language that that regular expression represents. And now we show, conversely, that for every finite automata, there's a regular expression that denotes the same language that it accepts. And so now we have a complete characterization that the set of regular languages is exactly the set of languages represented by regular expressions. And that's why they're called regular expressions as opposed to just expressions. How many, how many get all this? Good. Any, any questions about that? So regular languages, finite automata, regular expressions, all three characterizations or schemas denote the same class of objects, the class of regular languages. And that's very useful to know. And that, here's, the, here's that proof in the book on page, what, 70, 71, 72. So there's the uh, generalized finite automata construction. And to read more about it, look at those pages. And we talked about identities for regular expressions. There's the distributive law right, of concatenation distributed over union and so on from left, from right. Concatenation is associative, but not commutative. Right? Union is commutative and also associative. There's the identity element with respect to union, and that's the empty set. The identity element with respect to concatenation is the empty string, not the empty set. And a couple other expressions. So you can prove all of these. They're not axioms. They're theorems. It's not hard to prove them, but for fun, you could prove something like R star star is the same as R star. So starring something twice doesn't do you any, any more than starting it once, for example. Here are some interesting algorithms. So a problem is decidable if there's an, an algorithm for it. It doesn't matter how efficient or inefficient, because some problems don't have algorithms. And we already know a few, like the halting problem. And an algorithm has to be correct in every instance. It can't just be correct sometimes and incorrect other times, or it can't even be correct sometimes and give no answer other times. That's, that's, not, that's, not, that's not an algorithm. It's not a decidable algorithm. It's not something that always gives you an answer, right? A clock that stopped is still right twice a day, right? We mentioned that. That's no big feat to achieve that. It right? doesn't do you much good if an algorithm sometimes is wrong, even though it's right a lot of the time, or even an infinite number of times. It's not enough. All right, so give me algorithms for the following problems. I give, you a I give you a machine, M1, some finite automata, and you tell me if its language is empty. Does it accept any string whatsoever? What's your algorithm to determine that? So I, I hand to you a finite automata, I ask you, is its language empty or not? And you come back with a single bit, yes or no. Empty language or not empty language? What's your algorithm to determine that in general? How many understand the question? Really? Only five people understand even what I just asked. OK, so let me ask again. I give you a finite automata. How, how do I give it to you? Well, by listing the states, a transition function, the alphabet. You know, it's just a five tuple, right? 
So now you know the complete description of this finite automata with all the states, the start state, the final states, all the edges, the arcs, the transitions. Okay, so you have a complete description of this finite automata. This finite automata accepts some language. How many get that? It accepts some language. Now, the language could be empty. That's okay. But it's still a language. My question to you is, this finite automata I just gave you, is its language empty or not? How many understand the question now? Good. There's a little more, but still half the class. So. I know it's been a long break, uh, but uh, let's try to think about this. Yeah, so what do you say? So he says, look at the accepting states. And if there's an edge into an accepting state, then the language may not be empty. May not be empty. But could it still be empty nevertheless, even if there's some accepting states and edges into them? I mean, you say you can have accepting states, and you can even have edges into them, and the language could still be empty. How many say that? Okay. Why? It's true. Well, but if it's an empty, if a bunch of empty transitions, you're going through a bunch of empty transitions, accepting, and you've accepted the empty string. The empty string is not nothing; it's a string. The empty language is not a language containing the empty string. The empty language has zero strings. A language containing the empty string has one string, the empty string. So you have to be a little more nuanced, but thanks for speaking up. I appreciate it. Yeah. Ah, so you can have final states with edges into them, but they may still not be reachable from a, from a, from, from a beginning state. Right? It could be isolated piece of the machine here with all sorts of edges, but there's no way to get to it from the beginning. It's like a piece of code or a subroutine in your program that never gets used, never gets called. It's there, it's part of your program, but it'll never ever get called because it's not called from anywhere. So it's like a dead piece of code. It's still code, it's still there, it's still part of your program, it's just never going to be used. So same, it's the same with machines and states. All right, so let's keep trying. This is a good start though. Final states, edges into final states. Epsilon transition, what else? So Refine your algorithm now. Yeah. OK. All right, path, path finding algorithm. Somebody want to build on that? What, what are you looking for a path from where to where? What kind of paths are you looking for? From a start to an Final state, right? So if there's a path from a start state to a final state, whatever characters are on this path, even epsilons, that'll get you some way to get from an from a initial state to a final state, and the language won't be empty, right? So it's essentially it's graph reachability. You find a path from a start state to some final state. Which final state? Any final state. It's, it's good. Okay. So all it is is graph reachability. Algorithmically, how would you implement it? What kind of techniques would you use if you implement this in C or Java or C++ or whatever your Python, whatever your favorite language is? What kind of a subroutine or sub-algorithm or technique would you use? Or what would you call it? Is it divide and conquer? Is it a greedy algorithm? Is it, what is it? What are we talking about? Yeah, you can recursively expand out from the initial state, follow every possible hop away from the initial state and keep visiting things that you haven't visited before. And if you reach a place that you've visited before, don't expand from there because you've already been there, so you can mark the nodes and so on. What is that called? Algorithmically, is a name for such a thing. Brute force. I guess, I guess it is a type of brute force. What are other names for it? Uh, it's not as bad as traveling salesmen because you're not concerned with cycles, right? You just, just ways to reach things. You don't have to go in a perfect cycle. Uh, what other names can you think of? But I appreciate you your, 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 your speaking up. That's great. Yeah. The breadth first search, could you do a depth first search? Why not? Breadth first, depth first, either one would work. Okay, how fast would it run? Just so we're on the same page here. 
to implement this reasonably efficiently without being too wasteful and re repetitious, what kind of time complexity are we talking about here? Take a wild guess. You have to check every single node so it's at least as many as the nodes, and so it's at least linear. What is it at most, do you think? So you gave a good lower bound, linear. What's an upper bound? Which one? Uh, will it ever not complete? That, uh, that's a good point. An algorithm has to terminate. If not, it's not exactly an algorithm. It's something else. Better terminate and give you an answer at some point. You can't run forever. So how many, how many say this scheme will always terminate, always finish after a while? How many say sometimes it may run forever? When will it run forever? Okay, so if there's a cycle, he's saying it'll run forever. What do you say, what do you say to that? You mark the nodes where you've been, and when you reach a node that you've been to before, you don't pursue that node out anymore from there. So it's like leaving little breadcrumbs, right? You leave little breadcrumbs on the nodes. If you see a node with a breadcrumb on it, leave it alone. You've been there before. So you can avoid following the cycles. You don't want to run forever. Somebody say it would sometimes run forever. Well, that's good, because it won't. Uh, but, well, how fast will it run? Could it, could it go exponential time and then stop? I'm going to say it can go exponential time. I'm going to say polynomial time for some polynomial. Okay, that's getting a little better. How big a polynomial are we talking about? It, it is not hard. So, so I just give you a hint. It's not difficult. Right? It's not mysterious, not deep. It's, it's straightforward. Right? Uh, Cubic time, quadratic time, yeah. Yeah, you, you visit every state once. You follow every arc once. Because you can mark them and you never follow them again. Right? So you follow as many arcs and states as there are arcs and states. And there's a linear number of them by definition. That's the size of the input. The machine is however many arcs and states there are. So the runtime will be proportional to the number of arcs and states. So it'll be linear time. It won't be quadratic. If you implement it a little bit carefully, I mean, there's probably ways to be a little uncareful and get into quadratic time by checking a lot of, time, a lot of unnecessary, unnecessary things twice or more. But linear time will do it. How many see that? Linear time will get you there. So it's important that you see these things, right? When you're out in your job making 100K a year or more, you know, like a year or two, and somebody, you know, your employer says, you know, implement this on some big graph, like a social graph or a web links graph or thousands of different kinds of graph all over the place. You know, you want to take linear time, not quadratic, especially if the graph is big. Otherwise, your algorithm will start screeching to a halt when the graph gets into the millions of nodes. Quadratic on millions doesn't work. It takes too long. Linear on billions still works. Okay. Uh, any questions about that? So you're talking about graph reachability. Does there exist a path from here to there? Breadth first search, depth first search, both will get you there, if it's possible to get there. By the way, can you think of, of an everyday application where you kind of apply this algorithm to? I'll give you a hint. It's on your smartphone. You, you've used it many times. What app are we talking about? Graph reachability. Google Maps, or in general, navigation, right? You go on a drive somewhere, you type in a destination. That's exactly what your app does. It tries to find a path from your current location in GPS to the destination. What, what is the graph for that GPS application? What, what graph are we talking about here? Maybe somebody else who hasn't spoken. Yeah. The street intersections are the nodes. The edges are what? The road segments. Right. And as every intersection is a node, every road segment is an edge. There's your graph. How many get this? So you've ran this algorithm lots and lots of times. Just FYI. It's not that mysterious. Now, 
if your GPS app tries to run in quadratic time instead of linear time, like we were talking about here, how big is the geographic graph, the street intersection and street segment graph that we're talking about? How many, roughly, intersections and street segments are we talking about for the United States, say? 10, 100, 1,000? How big is this graph? Take a wild guess. I'm not asking an exact answer. I just want to within an order of magnitude, or even two orders of magnitude. You can be 100 times off and still be right. That's not asking for much, right? How big is the graph of the United States in the GPS app? Millions of nodes, or even tens of millions of nodes. It's huge. Quadratic is never going to work there. So linear is what the way it's implemented on your smartphone or GPS system. Anyway, question number two. Um, I give you a finite automata again, and this time I ask you not whether the language is empty, but I ask you rather whether the language is infinite or finite. Uh, by the way, on question one, why doesn't the following algorithm work? Take this finite automata, you're trying to find this language, whether it's empty or not. Run it on the first string in sigma star, see if it accepts. Run it on the second string in sigma star, see if it accepts. Run it on the third string in sigma star, see if it accepts. If it accepts on any one of them, you say it's not empty. If it doesn't accept all of them, you say it's empty. There's my algorithm. There's a couple of things wrong with this algorithm. What are they? Just, again, to make sure you're clear on this. There's an infinite amount of strings. And even if the language is finite, I'll have to try a lot of strings, an unbounded number of strings. And so you'll never know for sure, because you can't try them all, because you cannot iterate to infinity, because you'll never, you never stop and never end, and you'll never be able to report an answer, because you never stopped and never ended with an answer, because you never ended to begin with, because you're running forever. So that's not an algorithm. Something that runs forever is not an algorithm because you cannot report something after it finishes running if it runs forever, because there's no after at infinity. Infinity has no after. It goes on forever. OK, so and plus it's very inefficient. You have to try all possible strings and you know, exponential number of strings for even a small size. Right? So strings of size 30, there's 2 to the 30 strings of size 30 bits long if the characters are zeros and ones. That's a billion strings for just 30 characters of zeros and ones. All right, so that's kind of a good insight for this second question as well as the first, because you cannot try all possible strings and see which ones are in, which ones are out of the language, and then wait to do something after that, because there's no after, after infinity. It's one of those things. Infinity goes on forever. There's no last room in the infinite hotel, right? So what's an algorithm now? Determine whether this language is infinite or not. I give you the finite automata, it's fully described. You have it in your hands, you look at it. Is its language infinite or finite? Does it accept an infinite number of strings or only a finite number of strings? I understand the question, I just want to make sure. Okay. So only half the class, uh, a little dubious, but I'll take it. You know. Day after spring break, okay. So, any thoughts? Take wild guesses, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, there is an algorithm. Um, if there was no algorithm, I wouldn't be asking you to give one. Let's put it that way. It'd be, it'd be too cruel. I, I, I wouldn't play gotcha with you like that. If I say, give me an algorithm, it's because there is one, not because there isn't. Yeah. OK find an accept state that no matter what the input was, you can end up in that accept state. Um, okay, 
So not necessarily the same accept state, but some accept state for every input. For every input? I don't, ah, not necessarily. Could, OK, but what if it goes to non-accept states and then to another accept state after the non-accept states? That's OK, right? You don't want to prohibit that, necessarily. Right. And, and if it, and even, but even if that happens for a bunch of cases, but it doesn't happen for an infinite number of other cases, that's still OK, too. So it's not that you want to avoid that always. It's OK if that happens a bunch. In fact, it's OK if that happens an infinite number of times, as long as the other good case doesn't also happens an infinite number of times, too. And you can have infinity in both c categories, right? Just like there's infinity of primes, but there's also an infinity of non-primes, and they're, and they're disjoint. So one infinity doesn't exclude the infinity-ness of the other subset whose union is the infinite set itself. OK, so you may be onto something. What do you say? Find a loop that leads to a terminating state. So if you have a loop, and from that loop you can reach a terminating state, you can go around the loop many, many times, many times as you want, and then reach a terminating state, which means from there you can accept a bunch of different strings, one for every iteration of the loop, larger and larger strings, and that's an infinite family. That's good. That's very good progress. How many understand what he's getting at? Good. How many say we're done? How many say there's a bit of an issue still remaining? What's the issue? Yeah. Oh, but, but if there's one infinite family, that makes the, the whole language infinite, right? But I never said I want the entire language. I say I want to know if it's infinite. So if you found an infinite subfamily, that makes the whole language infinite because it's contained in that language. And you're done. The answer, you have your answer. The language is infinite. That's yeah, that's a, that's a good insight. Uh, he's saying that some languages are infinite that don't have this property of repetition in strings. It happens to be true. But they're also not regular, turns out. So there also won't be one of those, because I'm giving you a finite automaton. So the language, each language is, by definition, regular. So you're right, but it won't be an issue for this subtle reason. It's a very good insight. How many even understood what he, what he just said? That's all right. It's pretty advanced. So thank you, and congratulations. Uh, what else? Are we done? Is there some loose end? So we find a cycle, and from that cycle, some final state has to be reachable. How many say that's a sufficient criteria for the language being infinite? How many say there's a missing condition? How many have no opinion one or the other? How many understand my question? OK, that's good. So at least you're not asleep. You're responding to some things. OK, that's good. So let me repeat. So he's saying there's an infinite subfamily if there's a cycle in the machine. And from that cycle, you can reach some final state. So you can go around the cycle as many times as you want, get larger and larger string around the cycle, and then hit a final state and accept it. So you're accepting an infinite family of strings, which makes the language infinite. Is this a whole, is this a whole algorithm, or is this some, some loose end? Let me say loose end, bit of a condition. What is it? So I'll give you the hint. Yeah, there's a loose end. I'm not just teasing you here. There's a loose end here. Yeah. Yeah, the loop has to be reachable from a start state, from the start state. There's only one. How many get that? If the loop is not reachable, it doesn't do you any good. Right? You'll never get to it. So there's several things you have to check for. So you have to find a cycle. Sure enough, you have to find a loop. But once you find a loop, 
on that loop, that loop has to be reachable from the start state. And sure enough, from that loop, you have to reach a final state too. So there's three things you need to check for. A loop, it's the first thing. Second thing is the loop should be reachable from the start state. Third thing, from the loop, you should be able to reach a final state. Three conditions. Then, the language is infinite. Start from the start state, reach that loop, consume some characters, go around the loop as many times as you want. Then hop off that loop, reach a final state, accept. And there's your infinite family, which makes the language infinite. Now, there may be other things in the language, like you said, but that's okay. We already know the language infinite. We can give the answer and stop and declare victory. That's your algorithm. How many understand this algorithm? All right. How fast is this algorithm? If you understand it, tell me how fast it is as a function of the size of the finite automata. Let's say you have n states and arcs. How fast is this subroutine that determines these three conditions, roughly? Take a wild guess. Uh, is it exponential? How many say it's exponential time? All right. How many say it's polynomial time? Only a couple of people have opinions on that. Yeah. OK, let's not confuse the algorithm that finds the loop with the machine that actually cycles through the loop as it accepts strings. It's two separate matters, right? A compiler is not running your program. It checks your program for syntactical correctness, creates an executable from it, and steps back. The program hasn't been run yet. So let's not confuse the two things, but it's an easy thing to, to happen. So we're not running the machine. The machine is not running around loops. We're determining whether there are any loops that the machine can run around if the machine executed, but it's not executing. We're compiling over it, determining what it would do if it ran, but we're not running it. How many understand the subtle distinction? Good. So this is compile time. This is not run time. So how fast is this algorithm? How fast can you achieve this? I'll let you think about it. You know what? For extra credit, you tell me. Email it to the class website. So question number three. I give you two machines this time, machine one, machine two, and I ask you, is the language of this machine the same as the language of that machine? Do they have the same language? In other words, do they both accept the same set of strings overall? We're not running these machines. We're trying to determine whether their languages are the same or not. It's not, it's not running them. What's your algorithm now? And here's the hint on the screen. Consider the difference of these two machines, or rather, the difference of the two languages. So let's say the language of machine one is L1, the language of machine two is L2. So consider L1 minus L2, and separately consider L2 minus L1. What can you tell me about that, given this hint? So what's your algorithm? If the two machines have the same language, what can you tell me about these two expressions, L1 minus L2 and L2 minus L1, the two languages subtracted from one another? The, the two languages are equal, so their difference would be zero, but let's make that zero more precise. Let's nail down the type correctly. Is it the numerical zero? Which zero is it? The empty set. So it's the zero for sets. A zero for set is not the zero integer. It's the empty set. The type of the zero integer is a number. The type of the empty set is not a number. It's a set. But I'm just being very pedantic here. I mean, you had the right answer conceptually. I'm just being extra pedantic about the semantics so you don't make that mistake. So you know, most of you won't make that mistake when it really counts, when it's not obvious at all what the right answer is. All right. So the, the difference is the empty set both ways. This will be empty. This will be empty, too. 
And so how could you determine if the two of them are, are both empty? And it's an if and only if, right? The languages are the same if and only if. Both of these differences are both empty. How many get that? It's true not just about languages. It's true about sets in general. Languages is a type of set. So if it's true about sets, it's true about the special case of a set being a language, a set of strings. Because some sets are not collections of strings. Some sets contain dogs and cats and cars and all sorts of interesting things, but not strings, right? But this condition is true about all these other sets containing dogs and cats, too, and in particular about languages as well. How many get that? So if something about, is true about a general type, it's certainly true about a specific type, but not the other way around. If something is true about some specific type of objects, it's not necessarily true about general objects in general. It may be, but it, it's not necessary. It's not necessarily the case. Keep that in mind. It's, I know it sounds simple when you say it like that, but people go through life making a mistake repeatedly, including when it really counts. All right, so the two differences are the empty set, if and only if the two languages are the same. So now what? Where's the algorithm? Yeah. Yeah. So the intersection of two sets is all the elements that they have in common, that are in both sets. Oh, the subtraction is, is all the elements that are in one minus all the elements that are in the other. So the, the difference is basically all this pink stuff minus all this green stuff. Now, it'll be the pink minus these greens, but these that are not in the pink to begin with, they can't be subtracted because they ain't even there. So it'll be just the pink that's not the green. It'll be this pink stuff outside the green. Right here. That's the difference. And the other way, it's the same way, symmetrically. L2 minus L1 will be all this green stuff that's not pink. It'll, be, it'll stop right here, the boundary, and it'll be all this green stuff up to this boundary here. Good question. Always ask what the definition is of what it is you're talking about. Subtraction, or you know, in this case, set subtraction. Again, an easy mistake to make is to rush ahead trying to find an answer when you don't even understand the definitions or the terms. People do that all the time in life. Open the news and you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, so, uh, so where's the algorithm in all this? So we had a bunch of insights, but, but there's no algorithm yet. What's that? Well, he's asking a good question. He says, could you assume that you know the languages if I just give you the machines? It's a fair question. I give you the machine, but I haven't given you the language on a silver platter. How would you like the language, by the way, if, if, if you were to, to seek it or want to, to write it down? Or how, would you, how would you even write down the language of a machine? What, what, what notation or symbols would you use? Or would you just wave your hands and give some English description and hope that you're right? How would you nail down the machine given a finite automata that I give you? There's lots of ways to do it, but name three. Yeah. Yeah, you can get the regular expression. Write that down. How, by this generalized finite automata we just talked about 20 minutes ago, go through all that, you'll end up with a regular expression. How many get that? Okay, so that's one way. What's another way? Which one? Yeah, you can use some sort of other notation, and you can also look at it, analyze it, scratch your head, and just describe in English what the language is. You can say it's all even length strings, or all strings of size prime number, right? or all strings made of zeros and ones that correspond to perfect squares, or, or whatever. You can also describe, now this is not a foolproof way of doing it, you have to understand what's going on and do some proofs and so on, and, but that's another way of describing what a language is. Question. Uh, 
okay, he's asking, could you enumerate everything the machine accepts? In theory, you can somehow try to form that set. But in practice, how would you enumerate? Would you run it on the first string, the second string, the third string in sigma star? You can write it on all strings in sigma star. Every string that it accepts, you write down. But what's the issue with that method? It'll never end. Because it can accept an infinite language, and you'll never know what the last string is. In fact, there'll be no last string. So you'll be busy writing strings down that accept, and you'll do that forever, and you'll never have your answer. Right? Just like sigma star. If you try to write out all the strings in sigma star, there's an infinite number of them. So, but you can just say sigma star and stop, and we both know what the language is right now. We know it's infinite, and we know what's in it, we know what's not in it. And that's a finite description. It's not an infinite description. It's not an infinite process. What else? So, so, so again, where, where's the algorithm for question number three? Name it. Say it. Explain it. All we did was skirt around it so far with a bunch of insights, leading insights, helpful, hintful insights, but we still haven't said the algorithm and stopped. And maybe get some other people to participate. You know, these guys who keep answering my questions, very impressive. But other people should speak up, have a chance to feel this rush of saying something in public and take a chance. Maybe you'll be wrong, but you'll be brave. And that's already a victory. So let's have people say stuff. Yeah. Yeah, you could sort of do that. So, so we have the two machines. When I say consider the, the difference of the languages of these two machines, how would I represent the difference? I'll give you a hint. Cross product construction. How many remember cross product construction? Good. There is your big hint. How would you represent the difference? Yeah. Take the cross product of what? Close. How would you sort of take the stuff that's in both L1 and L2 and represent it in some distinct finite way? We don't even know what L1 and L2 are, right? We just know that they're the languages of these two machines. How, how would you present a third machine that accepts exactly the difference of the first two languages of the first two machines? Yeah. Yeah. Cross the two machines by creating this hybrid machine that has pairs of states. And, and, and have it be accepting of these pairs of states only if the first pair, the first of the pair is an accepting state and the second is not an accepting state. Those are your accepting states of the hybrid super machine with the super transition function. That's the cross product construction. And this hybrid crossed machine, cross of these two machines crossed together, this hybrid machine will accept the difference of the languages of the first two machines. How many get this? OK. Now, we're not done yet. That's the first part of the algorithm. What's the second part now? So you have this machine that supposedly accepts the difference of the languages of these first other two machines. What do you do with this hybrid crossed machine? You have it. You look at it. What are you trying to, what, do you, what would you like to do with it now that you have it? It's like the dog that keeps chasing a car, right? Do you ever see a dog chase a car? You know, he, he, sometimes the dog actually gets to the car and, and he doesn't know what to do next. You know, what's he going to do with a car? Right? So we have this machine. What, what are we going to do with it? Yeah. What's that? Yes. Apply the subroutine from question one. Question one exactly tells you whether the language of a machine is empty or not, and you want to know if the, this language is empty and this language is empty. Excellent. I should give you extra credit, even though I didn't promise anything. Extra credit. Send, send, send this answer to the class email address. You see, he pays to speak up. Right? 
We already have a subroutine that determines emptiness of, a la of, a, of the language of, of a given machine. So use the subroutine from part one in part three. How many times are we going to use that subroutine? This should be easy now. Twice, exactly. Call it twice. On what? Once on this and the other time on that. Two crossed machines. How many get this? Now we have something. We have an answer. We have an algorithm. It'll work. It's, it's even efficient. Any questions about this? So we've just been through three successively more subtle algorithms over finite automata, manipulating them, anal analyzing them, testing their properties. And I can give you lots and lots of more examples, and the book does, and the problem sets do too. So practice in trying to come up with algorithms that do these sorts of things over finite time and try to determine what they do, what they don't do, what their properties are. When you bash them together in various ways, what happens? Okay, any, any, any more questions or thoughts on all this? Question. Uh, it, it, from, from cross product to what? Ah, so, so we're trying to determine if these two languages are the same, and the two languages are the same of these two machines, if and only if the pairwise differences are both empty. Right? So create a machine that accepts the difference one way, and create another machine that accepts the difference the other way using cross product construction. Now we have two cross machines, and you want to test if their language is empty and its language is empty too. Well, you already have a subroutine that does exactly that right here. So use it twice. End of story. <coughs> Always use subroutines if you can. I know it sounds like simple, obvious advice, but don't reinvent the wheel if you don't have to. Right? Think about it. If you couldn't use subroutines in computer science, computer science would be useless. How, how many get what I just said? Every time you want to add two things together, you have to write from scratch a multiplication routine over bits. So think about how tedious programming would be then. Subroutines is what makes computers useful. Because things that you've done before, you can just utilize blindly, and you're guaranteed that they'll work, because they're correct, and you've tested them, and you've implemented them, and they already work, and there's no need to reinvent them. That's why you have subroutine libraries. And even in addition, there's subtraction, multiplication, and concatenation. These are all subroutines, even though they look atomic on your command line or on your expression line in a line of code. They're not atomic. Multiplication is not atomic. A lot of things happen when you say A times B. Millions of things happen under the hood. Because there's a subroutine that does multiplication somewhere. And luckily, you don't have to write it. So any more questions about this? All right, so uh, regular expression minimization, we already said it's very hard. In fact, it's P-space complete. When we get the empty completeness in a couple of weeks, you'll, you'll see how hard that really is. It's, it's, it's horrendous. But it's decidable. So you can have a very inefficient algorithm to do regular expression minimization. How would you minimize a regular expression if you're allowed to be very, very inefficient about it? Time is not an issue. It can take a long time to run, as long as it's not forever. Yeah. Yeah. List out every single regular expression smaller than the one you have in your hand. And what question are you trying to answer now? Is any one of them denoting the same language as yours? And if, and if the answer is yes from the smallest going on, to larger and larger ones, the answer is ever yes before you get to your own size. Yeah, there's your smaller one, your minimal one. How many regular expressions are there of a given size, roughly? Very, very roughly. Linear, quadratic, cubic, what are we talking about? How many regular expressions are there for a given size n of length n? Exponential, how many see exponential? So that algorithm is not very efficient at all, but it's an algorithm. That's something, because we already saw some problems have no algorithms, like the halting problem. The halting problem doesn't even have a super duper inefficient algorithm, never mind an efficient one. This one, it has an inefficient one. That's already a step ahead of the halting problem, which is even worse than this. 
Okay. And by the way, you probably can guess what I would ask you still about this. Once you have two regular expressions, yours and some small one that you suspect may be the same as yours as far as the language that it denotes, what's my question going to be? This is my meta question. What question am I about to ask you? By now you should... You should. How do you know that they're equivalent exactly? So, good. That's a good meta answer to the meta question. So what's the answer to the question then? How could you prove that they're equivalent, that regular expression A is the same as regular expression B in terms of the languages that they denote? This is a question about machines. Now I'm asking the same question about regular expressions. Not quite the same, it's similar. It kind of rings, uh, it rhymes, it rings similarly. But it's not exactly the same question. It's the analogous question. But that's already good insight, that it's an analogous question to this. But now, I'm not giving you two machines. I'm giving you two regular expressions. I'm asking you if whether, whether two regular expressions denote the same language. So, 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 so what, what, what? Well, a regular expression doesn't accept or not accept. It just denotes something. A machine accepts something. Right? A regular expression cannot run. It's not executable. Right? It, can, it can't do anything, much less accept or reject. How many get that? So it's a nice example of a type error. But thanks for pointing this out, you know, that machines are not expressions. They may denote the same objects, a regular language, but they're not the same object themselves. In fact, they don't even have the same type. One is a regular expression, which is a string. One is a machine, which is not a string. A machine has states and final state, start state, an alphabet, a transition function. It's not a string, per se. All right. So to give you two regular expressions, one and two, how can you tell me if they denote the same language? It's, it's not hard to answer this. I'm not asking you a trick question. I never ask you trick questions. I'm asking you questions that make you think. I'll admit to that. But that's my job. It's my gift to you, to make you think. But it's not a trick question. It's never a trick question. Yeah. Okay, and, and that's, that's a good plan, except how would, you, how would you construct these languages and their intersection or union or difference or whatever? You, know, you have two regular expressions. What do you do with them? How would you get from the expressions to the languages, per se? But it's a good, it's a good plan to do all that. How? How would you do it? Yeah. Yeah. Convert them into machines. Take the regular expression, convert it to a machine. Take this regular expression, convert it to a machine. And then ask this question, question number three. How many get that? Good. How would you convert a regular expression to a machine? How many think we've done this in class quite a bit? Good. When did we do this? We've done this right here. Right? So remember the rules for converting regular expressions into machines. You have a union, you do this. You have concatenation, you put them juxtaposed in series. You have clean closure, you create loops. Once you do that, you can take a regular expression like this and make a machine out of it, stepwise, building blockwise, and then you'll, here's your machine from the regular expression. Let me get this. So do that. Take the regular expression, do that to it. Take the second regular expression, do that to it too. And finally, when you have these two machines, ask this question of the two machines. You already know how to do that. We answered that, right? So you see how it goes. You know, once you have algorithms to answer certain questions, you can use them as subroutines, as building blocks to answer more complicated questions and different questions. That's called computer science. No joke. That's what we do as computer science. 
use answers to small questions to answer bigger questions. In fact, it's not just computer science. I'll take one of the words away, just leave you with one word. Which is it? It's science. It's not even reliant on computers. That's what we do as scientists. Remember, you're a scientist before you are a computer scientist. That's an important word in your job description. It's not the computer word that's important. It's the science word that's important. Computer is what you apply science to, to get things work done. All right, but to find the smallest possible Turing machines, or even the smallest possible program, or even the smallest possible push on automata, that's undecidable. There's not even an inefficient algorithm for those, and we'll, we'll get to that later. And now I want to introduce context-free languages. And we're talking about chapter two, roughly page 100, and also context-free grammars. And it's pretty straightforward. All it is is finite automata with a stack. These are push-down automata. So if you, you know, give a finite automata a stack so you can store stuff on the stack using pushes and pops, you get a push-down automata. And those, we'll, we'll see shortly, um, get you to context-free languages. So the context-free languages are more than the regular language. They contain the regular language. Every, re every, every regular language is also context-free. It's like a push-down automata that never uses its stack. So what do I mean by push-down automata that uses stack? We'll get to that in a minute, but first, Let's talk about it in terms of grammars. So you have a finite set of variables. This is a different computation model than machines. It's a grammar. A grammar is not a machine. A grammar has transformation rules. It has variables and terminals. Right? So a finite set of terminals, all the t's, and some finite set of productions, and some start symbol of the grammar. You've got to start somewhere, whether it's a grammar or a machine. And the productions basically take you from a variable, a V, a green V, it's color-coded, to some combination of variables and terminals. Right? And you keep applying the production rules. So you have a production rule alpha and some variable and some beta. And alpha and beta can be arbitrary strings of variables and terminals. You'll see examples in a minute, so it's not so mysterious. What you can do is replace the V with whatever the delta is. So it's a substitution rule. So production rules in the grammar are simply substitution, local substitution rules. You see something, you change it to something else. Locally, like, a, like an edit in a, in a string editor or, or, a word, you know, or a text editor. You change something to something else. That's a substitution rule. So, and the productions do not depend on the context. Notice that we apply this substitution rule here to make this substitution. We replace the vi by this delta, regardless of what alpha and beta were on either side, left or right of it. So it doesn't rely on context. It just makes the substitution blindly, which makes it a context-free substitution. That's why they're called context-free grammars. It's substitution rules that do not rely on context. Now, some grammars rely on context, and those are context-sensitive grammars. And that's even a larger class of languages. We won't get there just yet. All right, so that's why they're called context-free. So now you know. All right, so having said all that, let's just give an example to kind of simplify things a bit. So here's a grammar. The variable s can go to another instance of s followed by a little terminal a. So variables are large cap letters. Terminals are not variables. They're small, lowercase letters. Another rule says s goes to sb, and s goes to the empty string. So what's a production, a bunch of substitutions in this language? So here's the language. You can denote either like this or like this. This is or which means s can go to this or this or this. So this simply combines these three rules into a single line, it doesn't change anything. There's still the same three rules, just denoted more succinctly with less arrows and so on. You could have other variables. This one only has one variable. This grammar only has one variable. So a derivation is simply a, ser a series of substitutions. So for example, s can go to s a, and the second substitution, this s can now trigger uh, the third rule and go to epsilon, which means you just have the little a left, and you've produced the string a in this grammar, end of story. And there's no more substitutions because there's no more variables to substitute, so you're done. That's a termination when there's no more variables, only terminals left on the right-hand side. Here's a different derivation. S goes to SA, but then this S goes to an SB according to the second rule. Right? And this S goes to another SA and another SA. And finally, the final S here goes, triggers on a third rule, goes to an epsilon, and all you have left is AABA, and that's your string now. 
So it's, it's, it, it's not quite like finite automata that have states that cycle around with transition functions, but it's an active construct that generates stuff according to substitution rules, and which rule could you apply at any given moment? With whatever rule, whatever rule you can apply, you have the right to apply in any order you'd like. So there's a bit of non-determinism here, and that's okay. So, here, so these, are, these are four different separate derivations of these strings A, 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 B, A, B, B, A, 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 and the epsilon empty string. That's also derivable by firing the third rule right away and nothing else. So I mean, get all this. It's pretty straightforward, right? You can just apply the substitution rules in any order you want. And the language of this grammar, you tell me, how would you define, if you were inventing this about 70 years ago, how would you define the language of this grammar? So let's take a wild guess. What's that? Uh, well, some combinations of A and Bs will not necessarily be derivable from an arbitrary grammar. They'll be derivable from this grammar. Yeah. So, so, so let, me, let, me, let me ask you a simpler question. What's the language of this grammar? And he essentially said it. The language of this grammar is A plus B star. It's sigma star. Any combination of A's and B's is derivable from this grammar. How many can see that? Because you can apply these rules in any combination you want. The S is always on the left. You can always uh, spit out an A or a B, and at the end you terminate, so you can spit out any combinations of A's and B's in any order you'd like. So the language of this grammar is sigma star. In general, what's the language of an arbitrary grammar? How would you define the language of a grammar? Not for this particular one, but in general. Let me give you a hint. The language of a machine is what? The language of a finite automata is defined as what? Everything the machine accepts, or can accept, if it ran on that thing. The language of a grammar is analogously what? It's not a huge leap of logic here. Everything the language, everything the language of a grammar is everything that the language, the lang, everything that the grammar can construct or generate. Period. So, it's the analogous definition. I just wanted to see if you can tell it to me before I tell it to you. And, and somebody told it to me, so I'm glad. Yeah. Yeah, so he's asking, what if you keep applying this rule over and over and over again, you get lower, lower, larger and larger and larger string, that, that derivation will not terminate and will not result in a string. So whatever, whatever that is, it's not in the language because it's not complete yet. It's not a bunch of terminals and nothing else. So the, the only strings that are generatable in the grammar are strings that are pure terminals and no more variables. It's kind of a termination condition if, in, of, some, of some sort. Right? You can have multiple variables going on simultaneously, but eventually, in order to generate a string, you cannot have any more variables. Everything has to be a terminal. And then the string is in the language, and it's generated by the grammar, and everything is good. It's a, it's a, if you have a rule, let's say, let's say the only rule is S goes to S. That's it. The only rule is S goes to S. There's no terminals at all. That grammar will not generate anything, right? But the language of this grammar is still well defined. What's the language of that grammar? S goes to S, and there's no more rules, and there's nothing else going on. It's the empty language. So that language is still defined. It's the empty language, not nothing. It's the empty language, and that's it. For example, in other words, the language of a grammar are, is a set of all strings that the grammar can generate and terminate for each string with only terminals and no more variables for that production run, right? Okay, so, so these are the strings in the language. In this case, there's four of them. I, well, four examples here. There's a lot more, actually. All sigma stars is, is in this language. In fact, the language is sigma star, but these are the strings in the language. All right, so everything I said, I, I'm also explaining on this slide very explicitly. So a string is generated by a grammar if some derivation ends up with that string. And all terminals must be in that string, no variables. 
those variables are still running in a, in a way. You know, the, the grammar is not running per se because it's not a machine, but it keeps generating stuff as long as there's variables in the intermediate production. Okay. And the language of a grammar are all strings that the grammar generates. So for example, S goes to SA or to SB or to Epsilon, the language is sure enough sigma star like you said earlier. And a language is defined to be context-free if there is some context-free grammar that generates it. Just like a language is defined, was defined to be regular if there was some finite automata that accepts it. So it's regular if there's some finite automata that accepts it. It's context-free if there's some context-free grammar that generates it. Okay. So sigma star, for example, is context-free. Why? Because there's a context-free grammar that generates it. Now, it also happens to be regular. That's OK. It's both. Now, it turns out that some languages are context-free, but they're not regular. And one of those is 0 to the n, 1 to the n, equal numbers of zeros and 1s, juxtaposed. And we'll prove this soon enough. All right, so uh, how would you come up with a context-free grammar that generates palindromes? A palindrome can read, not can, but does read the same forwards and backwards. Like the word noon, the word civic, these read exactly the same but backwards and forward. Radar, race car, it's kind of interesting. Step on no pets, read that backwards and it'll say step on no pets. Uh, pretty cool. Huh? So com come up with a grammar that gives you all strings of this form. Not necessarily English words, but any string that reads the same backwards and forwards. So x, y, y, x is one of those. How would you generate palindromes? In other words, all strings such that the string and its reversal are one and the same thing for every single string in that language. How would you generate this language of palindromes? So the idea is you can generate the two ends simultaneously from the middle. So S goes to AAS, excuse me, ASA, or it goes to BSB, or it just goes to an A or a B or an epsilon. So this will give you the palindromes, because you can generate two A's or two B's on either side of the S, which is the variable. You can generate, and finally you can terminate with either one A, one B, or nothing. So this will give you all palindromes. How many can see that? Good. Will it give you the even length palindromes, the odd length palindromes, or all palindromes? Should be all, yeah. That's why I have this extra production here. If I just had an A or a B and no epsilon, it would give me only which length palindromes? Odd. Right? If I had no A and no B, just the epsilon plus these first rules, which length palindromes will it give me? Even ones. So just to make sure. So for example, here's a derivation. S goes to ASA. S goes again to B, S, B right here. It's color-coded, green production, right? And finally, that S goes to an epsilon, so you get A, B, B, A, and sure enough, it's a palindrome. And this will give you only palindromes, this grammar, including all those ones up here. Of course, if the alphabet contained you know, all the letters of the English alphabet, not just A's and B's. Any questions about this? So it's an example of a context-free grammar. Here's another derivation, another palindrome. This one is odd length. And you can play with these grammars. Please do a bunch of exercises about these grammars. Try to come up with grammars for certain languages, like the problem sets suggest. Um, play with um, uh, the uh, define automata simulator, JFLAP. How many have used JFLAP already? It's a few of you. Really, it should be all of you. You know, if I ask you, can you program it? You say, yeah, I can program. I wrote lots of programs on paper. I said, did you ever compile one and run it? You said, no, but I wrote a lot of programs on paper. That's what we're talking about if you haven't used JFLAP. It, it's a silly situation. Right? I just want to bring it to your attention yet again. I've said that before. So run them, play with them, see how they work, modify them, debug them, just like you would programs, because they are programs. Final automatas are programs. How many get this? Find out the there's a program. They're simple programs, but they're programs nevertheless. They're not equations. They're not polynomials. They're programs. 
They run if you run them. So I'm telling you, please run them. Don't just write programs on paper and walk away as if you won the lottery. See if they run. Compile them, run them, play with them, modify them, see what they do on different inputs, just like you do with programs. It's not, not asking for something mysterious or for subtle reasons here. It's pretty straightforward. All right, so uh, here's a context-free grammar that generates regular, uh, uh, well-formed parentheses. So S goes to SS, or parentheses S parentheses, or epsilon. And this will give you all well-formed ways to nest things using parentheses. So it will not give you pr open paren, open paren, close paren, and that's it. Because that's not well-formed. There's two opens, but only one close, and it's kind of unbalanced parentheses. So it will give you all well-balanced parentheses expressions. So here's another derivation. Here we get a nesting. and get more complicated and get all well-balanced parentheses. How many get this, see, know how this works, see how, see how it works and why? Because the production rules either juxtapose parentheses or nest parentheses. And that's really the two rules that you need to get all well-formed strings representing nestings of all kinds of parentheses that are correct, correct nestings, not grammatic, you know, grammatically incorrect nestings of parentheses. So there's lots of other ways to r write a grammar that does the same thing. Just like there's lots of, lots of other ways to produce a finite automata that performs the same task, accepts the same language. Just like there's lots of ways to write a program that does the same specification or task that you're given to do. If I ask you all to write a prime number program, all 10 or 15 lines of it, and you all went, come back in an hour and you know, presented me with 100 plus programs, Chances are, no two programs will be the same. Exactly down to the variable name and the spacing and the tabs. And how many get that? Unless you know, people copied, or unless there was some lucky accident or coincidence. Same with grammars. Same with finite automata. There's lots of ways to create a finite automata or a grammar that does something. But just like programming, there's lots of ways to do it inefficiently or you know, in a way that kind of makes less sense and is more obscure and so on. This grammar here generates well-formed parentheses also. But it does it in a slightly more obscure way, but it's shorter. It's less characters to, to denote the grammar. So I'm, I'm telling you that the answer here is yes. The, the language of this grammar, G2, is the same as that language of G1, all well-formed nested parentheses. But it's not obvious that it's true. For extra credit, prove it. All right, uh, give me a grammar that puts out correct syntactically valid regular expressions. So here I'm kind of mixing metaphors a little bit because the output of this grammar is a bunch of strings that correspond to regular expressions. The grammar itself is not a regular expression, and its language is not a regular expression. It's not even a regular language. Right? But uh, here are the production rules. You can basically, for every character, spit out that character from the variable s, or put s in parentheses, so you can nest it in parentheses, or you can juxtapose it by itself next to another copy of itself, which is basically concatenation, denoting concatenation in regular expressions. Or you can put a star after it, which denotes clean closure. Or you can basically put a plus sign between two copies of the S, which denotes what? A plus denotes, a plus denotes union, say it loud, say it proud, good. So once you start executing these production rules, or more precisely, applying these production rules to the initial start symbol of the grammar, you get longer and longer derivations, coming up with longer and longer strings denoting regular expressions. So here's, you put a star on the S, then the S becomes in parentheses according to the first rule here, then it basically copies itself with a plus in between the two copies, which is the fourth generation, fourth, fourth rule for generating <coughs> derivations in this grammar. And finally, both of these S's go to A and B according to the first rule here. So we created A plus B star. We didn't create the language A plus B star. We created the regular expression denoting the language A plus B star. But the regular expression still has parentheses A plus B parentheses and the asterisk symbol. That's what the string is derivable in this grammar in such a manner. How many get this? And if you apply these rules in different combinations, you get lots and lots of other more complicated regular expressions. But this grammar here, simple though it is, accounts for all possible regular expressions. All of them. How many are there? 
How many regular expressions are there total? Infinite number, right? Now you see the, the usefulness of such grammars is because with a few production rules, you can capture very large, complicated sets of objects, like regular expressions, well-formed parentheses, and in compiler design, arithmetic expressions. So with a very few simple production rules, you can capture all possible regular expressions or arithmetic expressions. So compilers use context-free grammars all the time to determine the syntactical correctness of expressions and programs and so on. That's one of the many uses of context-free grammars. All right, so more about that next time. So the, the midterm will be available, we said, I think, this Friday, right? And then you'll have a window of four or five days, maybe five days to do it. I'll announce it by email. It'll be a take-home. See you on Thursday. <laughs>